are in listen-only mode. And good afternoon and welcome to uh, Holistic Management Lunch Hour. And today uh, we have with us Jason Virtue. Good afternoon, Jason. Hi, Judith. How are you going? I'm very well, thank you. Pretty good, yeah. So, um, Jeffrey today is not with us. He's down in the cold of Canberra. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that you could make some time to, to come on the call today. That's all right. It's always a pleasure to help folks that are uh, serious about creating some change. Oh, wonderful. Um, welcome to those that have got come on the line already. I can see a few people have signed on. I just wanted to remind people um, where we are today in the course material. So if you go into the Savory um, Hub, uh, again, you can click on Modules. And when you scroll down, the questions that we're doing today are right at the bottom, which is called Implementation Mastery of Holistic Management. And these two here, Reflection on Holistic Management and the Final Evaluation of Foundations of Holistic Management. And I've, I promised um, Peter that I would do a little bit of an introduction on how to chat so he can ask me a question. Um, so over on the side panel, you should have a little little piece that looks a bit like this. Obviously, yours might be a little bit different. And when you go down, you just go into, you can click on the chat. So you click on the little plus bar here that opens out the chat window. So um, you'll notice I'm, I'm taking some keys out of the Microsoft book and only doing a, um, it's not a live demo. <laughs> so once you've clicked on it, it becomes a minor sign and that means that the chat is open. And you can, um, it's a bit tricky because you can do to the entire audience and that's sort of the default. But if you knew, you could actually um, just do to individuals. But just to ask us a question, um, just do it to the entire audience. And all you need to do then is uh, to type into your question. So you put that in the little box here. You just put your, your icon here and type in what the question was. And of course, then all you have to do is to press the send button. And when you press send, you should be able to see your comment come up here in the little bar and um, I promise I will try and try and look out for for people asking asking questions because we'd love to have some feedback on uh, on while we're online. I have plenty of people ask me things um, after the call or after they've listened to the recording, but we, we think it would probably be um, useful as we say things. Perhaps it's not clear or you just want to have uh, some clarification, especially while Jason's here. Um, because he certainly is much more experienced at this sort of stuff than than um, than myself. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an introduction on how to to do a chat. You can get do more, you know, fantastic things with questions and things. But I think if we could just have a go at, at typing in some some quick queries in the bottom here, that'd be that'd be great. Okay, so this week is uh, covering. I've called it holistic management reflections, Jason, just because there's the filter questions, there's processes unique to holistic management, holistic financial planning, holistic land planning, and ecological monitoring, which is essentially, uh, you know, what's, what I think is, is special about holistic management, what sets it apart from, from almost anything else that, that I've ever come across. Um, so... Um, Jason, have, have you come across? I don't know whether you've whether you, you would agree that that's you know that's basically the the um, the nuts and bolts of what's uh, special about holistic management. Yeah, Judith. The um, the the thing with the testing questions is that there's really no other management procedure that that I've seen or, or that uh, um, some of our fellow educators have seen that that has this mechanism or these questions in, in part of the process that helps you see or get a rough idea before you do anything what the likely outcomes of, of an action is going to be. Uh, and it's, uh, t testing, uh, tr uh, helping people get a handle on managing holistically, I spend a lot of time in class getting them comfortable with testing activities before they do them because I'd rather you sit down in the office and waste two or three or even four hours testing things, having a look at them, asking more questions rather than just racing out and doing stuff. And I like to use the example when we for, first bought our farm at Gympie, 
uh, we went round and repaired a heap of fences that had, had fallen over in the preceding 20 years before we got there. And then once we changed our practices, within four or five years, I'd pulled out five or six of those fences because they were really in the wrong place. If I'd have sat down and, and had this, um, had these tools and these procedures at hand at the time, I could have saved myself a heck of a lot of time and money by asking some questions about an action before we do it. So management, we want to find out what's going on and what the likely outcome is before we do anything. And certainly it fits in well with those, as you've said there, those are things that are fairly unique to holistic management and because they help people focus on the thing that's most important to them all the time. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, the first question is how could holistic management help you achieve your goals and objectives? And I, I went stalking you earlier this morning, Jason. It's funny I found this on this on your website, but I wondered if you might um, express a little bit, like I, you know, of some of the things that you achieved. Obviously, this is through um, you know holistic management. Chemical usage reduced by 95%, eliminated, eliminated 99% of the bare soil. Um, the required management time fell to much less than 10 hours a week. And, um, you know, this is something that people are almost embarrassed about who do holistic management because you're supposed to work hard on your farm, aren't you? And, and, and here we are actually reducing the amount of time that we spend on, on the properties and still having really positive results. Um, do, do you find people are, are um, just absolutely amazed that, that it's, it's actually less work when you get into it? Look, the, the, the few people that we know, or, or sorry, the, the people that we know around the world that have, have, have started practicing um, holistic management on a daily basis, because a lot of jobs and tasks and activities that you felt in the past were important and were critical, all of a sudden they didn't matter anymore. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is we took, we took the decision that we only wanted to have one herd of animals on our farm at any one time. That didn't, we didn't, you know, for many years we'd had a bull herd because we only used the bulls for three months of the year. But we took the decision based on what we wanted to achieve. We only wanted one herd of animals. So that immediately meant that we only had one herd of animals to look at, to look after, because we were quite happy to move animals on a daily basis you know, every day we'd go down, and even though ours was only a 300 acre property, but every day we'd go down, open a string fence, shift the cow, shut the string fence and go home. And we did that every day. Sometimes we did it every 36 hours, sometimes we did it every two days, but all of a sudden, because the biology of the property changed so much, all of those little jobs that we used to spend time doing, chipping thistles, spraying weeds, worrying about things like that, you know, we didn't have to do it anymore. We didn't have to slash anymore because we were using the animals as a tool to manage the landscape as well as create an income. Uh, and you know, once once you get this procedure happening and this routine happening of I'm using my animals as a tool rather than just as a as a as a, a commodity to to create money, uh, amazing things happen. And all of a sudden, we had all this time that we could put to better investment, either on ourselves or working off farm or other things. And most of the things I, I, you know, I didn't realise this until you've just put that slide of mine up there. At least everything except the last one, um, everything except the last one and the second and the third last one are results of changing the way our livestock behave and how our land, our livestock interact with our land. The sec, the third last one, um, probably a lot of that related to the to the animal heard and how we changed as well, but the third last one and the very last one, those are functions of changing the way we make our decisions and getting really serious and selfish about what we wanted to achieve as people and as a family and then making the decisions to make that happen. And you know, if, if you set your mind to creating a wonderful piece of land that's fully functional all the time and to making a profit every year and to reducing your costs, you will make it happen. The question is, how serious are you about deciding what your life is going to be like? Yeah, that's interesting. And um, people often 
you know, think, oh, well, we need another block, and, and yet you've actually increased your compa carrying capacity on your property by more than 50% just by, by changing the way that you manage your livestock, mm. which, is, which is pretty powerful, really, you know. Um, and I love your carving percentage. And, and it went people, up. Look, look, it did, and, and, you know, we did industry best practice for years. Is that for a lot of time there, you know, we had a, a three month and a three month carving interval, but we had a lot of land that was just out of production because the bulls lived in it for nine months of the year. So, you know, you had three bulls on on eleven acres for two hundred and seventy days, and then when we changed it and kept the bulls in the herd all the time, the amount of animal days we took out of that paddock went up exponentially simply because it wasn't sitting there doing nothing, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we were quite happy in our hole under management that we had sometimes we had odd calves that were out of season and I'm happy to put my hand up and confess that, you know, I'm not the best animal manager in the world and there's still things we could do with our herd to improve it. But we were getting much more productivity hand in hand with a decreased cost of production. So we were getting two bites of the cherry mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as, as most of our fellow farmers understand it's pretty hard to get one bite of the cherry. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty fantastic. So that's a great answer to the first question, how could holistic management help you achieve your goals and objectives because it, I just I just loved all the things that you, you'd actually achieved. I thought that's a great example. Yeah, uh, we'd be looking for fertility. So m more lambs and we've got our rams in the one mob at the moment and to, to our surprise, I don't know whether people said to you that your bulls wouldn't perform that well, but people said to us, oh, the, the rams, they won't want to be with the flock all the time, but they do love being with the flock. They've never wanted to come home and they seem to be doing really well. I think they were in the ram paddock for so long, perhaps they sort of chewed the ram paddock out a bit, but now that we've included that into the land management, it seems like they get better nutrition um, because they're moving with the ewes and getting better feed, I think, but I don't know. Uh, I just love that you're able to heal the earth with with the with the, with the tools that you're given. Um, old Dreamland has been declining in fertility for um, probably probably since the 70s, um, or maybe even before then. So, and um, yeah, it's just great to be able to 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 bring that fertility back up. And previously, we thought that was probably not doable, and now we sort of believe that it, well, we do believe that it is. And I just love the carbon offsets as well, um, that you can actually do something for the planet. You know, as, as livestock farmers, we sort of get a bad rap and whether there's methane or whatever there is, that because you keep animals, you, you, you know, that you're probably not the greatest person in the world. And I just love that you can you can actually sequester carbon with the livestock as a tool, as, as, you, as you, you pointed out. So that was the three things that I put together for, for my answer. Um, Question two. I'm just having a quick look in the chat box. I haven't seen any chat questions yet, so I'll move on to question two. Uh, what are the next steps that you can take to better understand how to manage holistically? Um, so I um, actually caught up with um, Moira from the Northern Territory, who's been studying under um, Brian Marshall, and she had this idea of a can-do plot, can plot, sorry, which is sort of like a, a learning site or a demonstration site that, that we have up here. And uh, I think maybe, you know, that's the part of, that's, you know, even, would you say that people, even if they have this little amount of understanding, get the book and, and get a little part of your property or, or maybe the whole lot and just start to see what you can actually achieve? What what, what can you actually achieve out of this? Is that the, the sort of the next step, do you think? Or? Yeah, Judith, it's... Uh, there's very few people that when they come to holistic management are prepared to take on wholesale change across their their, their entire whole under management immediately. Mm -hmm. And the people that do have usually had to change because of duress. They've been under uh, financial duress or social duress or family duress. So there has, there has had to have been wholesale change. Otherwise, they were probably going to lose the farm. And that's not a very nice or a comfortable place from which to undertake change. However, these can-do plots are a wonderful idea and some of our educators, particularly Graham Hand in Victoria, he's recommending that people do a similar sort of thing where 
find a piece of land on your farm, preferably near the house. It doesn't have to have water. It might need to be an acre or two or three acres and just fence it off and just practice some of the stuff that we talk about on that piece of block for 12 months and see what ha happens. Mm. Um, you know, put all, all your animals in there at a very high density for say three or four hours or, or even half a day in the very, very beginning and then take them out and don't let any animals back into that paddock, something like that. You wouldn't even have to have water available for those animals because everyone could fence off a small piece of their land and not affect the current productivity by taking an acre or two out of production for 12 months and having a practice at this. You know, we're not betting the house. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything that anyone else knows about in case it fails. But have a go at this yourself on straight away. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, but Jason, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, it just it just kept coming in and out there. I think um, most people would have got the the what you were, were suggesting. It's great. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, that's certainly how we started. That's how um, Brian sort of couched it. Was you don't have to do this with the whole place. Uh, you can, you can just have a test. Um, so that, that is a definitely a great way to start out. And I think uh, it's not until you start to see things um, actually changing that you start to understand. And I, I'm continually going back and saying, oh, that's what they mean when, when they say, oh, such and such. Uh, a good example was um, we've been umming and ahhing about the grazing plan and whether it's to be open and closed. And Brian sort of said to us, uh, Wilberg said, well, maybe, you know, you should have it closed. But he didn't sort of try and force it too much because we have a lot of um, green um, annuals that, that feed the sheep through the winter. But they just disappear as soon as that weather changes. They just disappear. And I remember thinking, yeah, that's what he's on about there. That actually does happen. So we need to include that in our planning for next year. So. It, you know, having seeing it is is definitely much different than um, than actually just reading it in a book. It's so much so much more powerful. So um, the next little section is more the questions about um, reviewing the holistic context and and things that we've gone through. And some of these, um, Jason, I I may have got the wrong end. I find some of these questions a little bit difficult to understand. So if there's something that I'm missing, please do pointed out. So the first one was to describe what three okay. three considerations holistic management enables you to consider when making decisions and what is this called? And I think I think that what they're referring to is the holistic context, the quality of life, the forms of production and the future resource base description. What do yeah, you Yeah Judith, I, I think you've nailed that. You think that's right? Okay, cool. Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, question two. A holistic perspective is essential in management. It refers to the importance of acknowledging what within the different aspects of the whole. And I think that is connectivity or um, synergies in the whole was something else that I thought about, I think. Hmm. Uh, look, I haven't actually seen that question before. I have to confess, I've, I've had a bit of a look at the at the cache from SI. This uh, is essentially refers to the importance of acknowledging uh, what within the different aspects of the whole. Well, one thing that we do have to acknowledge when we're when we're looking at a whole situation is the people that's involved and their thoughts and feelings uh, mm. uh, and and how they want to be perceived um, and how they want how they want to fit in. So yeah. that's something that's very important that we acknowledge. And it's probably far more important than the, than the biology because, um, you know, when we, when we give nature the opportunity to function without us in the room, without humans in the room, she does a pretty good job. Um, however, when we come along and want to be part of it, um, sometimes she has a bit of trouble making things work. So. And the thing that we're seeing from teaching people, you know, in Australia and all around the world, 
it's the people part that's that's the um, it's the most important that we get approximately right instead of dead wrong. Mm. Uh, the biology will take care of itself if we create the opportunity, but if we get the people thing wrong, then uh, the peanuts can hit the fan big time. Yeah, yeah. Hence the focus on on the perspective and, and things. Question three, I've I've put it into a. It's actually in a poll, but we'll just read it in full because. It's so wordy, I can't fit it in full in the poll, but we'll let everyone vote on it, but we'll read it through. So, which of the following statements are true about the four key insights? Mm. And I'm just going to move my thing over the other, other way. That led to the development of the holistic management framework. So, overgrazing is a matter of the amount of time plants are exposed and re-exposed to grazing animals. Animals that remain bunched up as if they are in the presence of predators have an impact on the health of the land. A holistic perspective is essential in management. Environments exist on different ends of a scale depending on how well humidity is distributed throughout the year and how quickly dead vegetation breaks down. And then five is all of the above are true. So um, let me just open up the poll so we can see if we can launch it for you. So we should be able to, you should be able to see the poll on the screen there. And um, try not to, try not to bias it too much, but um, I think that most people would have got that all of the above are true, yeah? Yep. <laughs> um, One, yeah, one person. Here we go. Hold on. I think I've lost the screen. Hold on. <laughs> so if I share it now, you should be able to see, yeah, that, that it is, in fact, all of the above are actually true for that one. I'll hide it. Okay. And question four is a question about the, the brittleness scale. At the extreme end of the brittleness scale, what environment would typify a very brittle environment and what would typify a very non-brittle environment? Um, so I've stolen a slide. Um, so brittle is very dry, desert is, is the most brittle, so on a one, a one would be desert, and non-brittle is really moist, and that would be a ten, which would be rainforest. Is that the right way around, or is it the other way around? Uh, Judith, look, I, I, I have to confess, I always get them back the front, but the, the important thing is to remember that, um, yes, it, it, on, a, on a scale, at one end it's brittle, and on the other end it's non-brittle, it's non and every environment on Earth, there's a few environments on Earth that are at either end and every other environment is somewhere on that continuum. Yeah. And so, I think I'm just, I'm just looking around on my overcrowded desk for a, a model card that may have it on there. I think it's uh, the rainforest it's is text. number one. How convenient. <laughs> rainforest I think is but, number one. I think you're right. Yeah, I had it around the wrong way first Correct. time. Correct, yes. Yeah. No, yes. Yeah. yeah, and so they res the, the point about it is that I thought this slide was really good because the point of it is really that they respond very differently to the same management style. So rest in a non-brittle environment moves it to a more complex uh, rainforesty type environment, but rest in a brittle environment actually dis degrades that, that environment and that is because in brittle environments it's really not very um, humid for many months of the year and that means that the biological community actually exists within the rumen of grazing animals part of the year. And I thought this slide actually sums up the whole thing um, very succinctly. Mm. Um, I guess um, what happens I mean, they must exist in other in, um, other other birds, and if you think about Australia, I mean, emus um, are a big thing on our country, and and different types of birds and things like that. So it must also exist in in birds, or is it just the rumen? And what's so special about that? 
uh, Judith, what what I think what Alan's alluding to there is that yes, within each each living person and with each living animal, the insides of us are dark, wet, and warm, as long as we're alive. And as long as we ingest things, we, we chew them and swallow them, then the rumen, your rumen, a cow's rumen, my rumen, an emu's rumen, there's stuff happening in there that takes in that organic matter we consume and extracts nutrients of it and the bits that it doesn't want come out the other end. Mm. The, the fact of the matter is when we, when we focus on these brittle tending environments, so these environments somewhere between five and ten on the brittleness scale, the grasslands of the world and the savanna lands of the world, uh, the only way we can break down very, very large quantities of organic matter in those environments in the times of the year when it doesn't want to rain and everything is dry is inside an animal. And we need, you know, if we wanted to replicate uh, the, the, the decay process of the Daintree rainforest, we're going to need a heck of a lot of animals eating a heck of a lot of organic matter every day. Mm. So the fact of the matter is, yes, where is a non-brittle tending environment in a desert? Well, it's inside an animal. And, you know, because those, those grasslands of the world and those savanna lands of the world comprise better than two-thirds of the land mass, of the world, there's a heck of a lot of organic matter that has to get cycled, that has to go through something and break down and go back to the soil if that environment is to stay healthy all the time. And that, that you know, and this might be a question for another day, but I'd, I'd highly recommend you spend a bit of time with folks talking about this tool of rest because um, everywhere I go, I, I still, I, I see people using rest when they actually, in a grazing situation, when they mean recovery. So there's a lack of understanding out there in the community about what rest is and the role it plays in managing landscapes. So yeah, what, what, what Alan's talking about there is grazing animals are the only way that we can break down and cycle lots and lots of organic matter in those non-brittle tending environments. Yeah. So these two words here, the the rest here and the rest here, really should be to be accurate. We really mean recovery. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. No, no. I'm I'm, I'm saying they're correct. They're correct where you say them there. But there, there's a there's a huge misunderstanding about what rest is. And everywhere I I, I hear people use the word rest. Um, they don't understand that rest is a tool that we can apply to the environment. What they're actually talking about is we're, we're talking about a tool of recovery where we've had grazing animals in a landscape, we've taken them out of that landscape for a short period of time, we're resting it. They, they, and what they're actually saying is we're letting the plants recover from the grazing that has been taken place and we will put the animals back at another time. Mm. So what they're actually doing is they're allowing plants to recover. The tool of rest, as defined in the textbook, is something completely different. Recovery is part of the tool of grazing and animal impact. Mm. So in the, on that slide there, you've got it, you've got it correct. But you know, everywhere we say people talk about rest, they don't understand rest the way holistic management talks about it because we use it as a tool to either increase the biological complexity of environments or to decrease the biological complexity of environments as you've so uh, eloquently expressed there in that slide. No, it was, it's not my slide. Um, it's, it's, oh. I think Ian Mitchell's slide actually. <laughs> I've stolen Ian oh, Mitchell's okay. slide. Yeah, but I couldn't, I couldn't put it any better than, my, than uh, that myself so I thought, well, way, hey. That's great. Um, you know, we, we did cover the rest and recovery um, a couple of weeks back, but I just find it's just so amazing. You know, it's great to be reminded of it. Um, no, many, no matter how many times I read the book, I seem to find new things in it that I'm still learning. So Indeed. it'll probably Indeed. go on forever. So, Okay, uh, next question. True or false, the easiest way to determine the level of ecosystem functioning is to determine an indicator species and see how healthy it is. So let's let people I'll just check this one and I'll launch it. I think you can read it in, I had trouble fitting 
fitting uh, fitting all of the words in. But the easiest way to determine the level of ecological functioning is to determine an indicator species and see how healthy it is. I'll just give people a few more seconds to, to con contemplate that one. Um, did I see that you have, um, I saw a photo of you just recently, Jason, and, and it was with camels on ABC, uh, ABC Landline. Yes, it's our, our dear friends at HMI in, in um, Albuquerque sponsored an open gate day that we had up here in the Burnett and um, Craig and Claire Kaepernick that did some training, uh, they did a training course last year, they've put three, they've purchased and put three camels in with their herd of about 80 cows mm -hmm. and they're in the process, they bought two donkeys and they're going to put them in and uh, it was amazing that the two times I visited their property to watch the camels and the effect that they're having on the on the trees and the shrubs that the cows don't want to touch or can't reach, uh -huh. uh, and so what they what they're actually doing is they're increasing the amount of <coughs> organic matter and nutrient and mineral that's cycling because you've got a different species of grazing animal in this herd. So they've gone from cows to cows and camels and donkeys and they've each got a, a rumen and they've each got a different set of microflora and bugs that live in the rumen and they each want to eat some of the same thing but a lot of the time they want to eat a lot of the different things. And we were, as we were standing there in the paddock having a look at the, the intensive grazing, one of the bull camels came over and he got into a lantana bush and he just ate the flowers. He just stood there for about five minutes and all he ate were the flowers of the lantana bush. It, with, it just pinned his ears back and he couldn't get enough of them. Hmm. And it was like we'd, we'd teed it up for it to happen. The cows don't want to eat that. The donkeys might not want to eat it and nothing else really wants to eat it. But all of a sudden they've found a species of animal that they can use and it's going to help change the biological mix of plants in their landscape. Yeah. And this is what we talk about. When we, when we think of how nature functions and how things in Africa and the other places in the world where there have been large herds, we've got no idea how complex those environments are. So if we can replicate that ourselves at home, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's probably worth our while to do so because it's increasing the biological complexity on our farms. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, I can see lots of really good uses. Um, so we're a bit we're a bit. We've got one bit either side of of whether this is uh, to determine the the indicator species and see how healthy is it. Is it true or false? I'm going to say it's false. Uh, is that is that the correct answer, Jason? Do you think? Um, I have to know why you want to say false. Because it's actually the functioning of the of the actual ground cover that's more important rather than looking at a particular species. It's the whole biodiversity of the thing rather than just looking at one species, isn't it? So you're actually, what I think you may be wishing to say is you want to have a look at how the four ecosystem processes are functioning. Yeah, oh, I see. Um, because uh, if, if one of them's poor, there's a jolly good chance all of them will be poor. Uh, and it may well be that it may well be the case that when we do our survey, something may have happened that the indicator species is enjoying a relatively happy time at that point of time, and and it may give us a false a false reading. So, yeah, I'm I'm probably going to go with you and say it's false that we hmm. really want to look at the four ecosystem processes and see how they're functioning. And there's the uh, hint there as well, which you picked up with the level of ecosystem functioning. It was a bit of a hint in that question as well. These aren't easy questions. Um, Jeffrey and I often, how this all started was Jeffrey and I would ring each other up and say, well, what do you think about this question? So, um, you know, we thought other people probably would, uh, would, would think the same thing. So here's the next one. We'll just read it while it's on the screen because I think I cut a few things off. I've got limited characters in the poll. Which of the following are commonly indicated when people make decisions? They consider a number of factors that will influence their decisions, decide what is best and move forward with implementation. They assume they are wrong and monitor for the earliest indicator. They test their decision with a description of the life they want to live in mind. They replan as soon as it's necessary 
uh, and then number five, all of the above are included. So I'll just open this up for you, if I can launch it. Yeah, I think I'm. I think it's open now for you to have a have a go at that one. I'll leave it open for a, a few ticks. I, I realise while I talk over people, I'm making it really different, difficult for those people who um who, who like to think with no one talking to them. <laughs> <laughs> which is me I'm very I can't think and and consider a, a poll like this myself either so Jason when you have those camels in there what is the process that you'll use to test whether the camels are actually working um, first off at the earliest indicator of whether the camels are working what do you think you would use I think you'd have some sort of ecological monitoring um. Oh, certainly, and and the thing that springs to mind straight away is watch, you know, spend a bit of time in the paddock and watch how those animals graze. And certainly, the the camels did want to eat some of the grass that the cows want to eat. Mm. But the fact of the matter is, you know, it, you'd be hard pressed to find a cow that could lift the chewing parts of its mouth more than six feet off the ground for an extended period of time. Mm. So when you think about that it's easy to understand why in some environments a browse line develops because the cows, if they're chasing a bit of green feed and it's on a tree, if they can reach it, they will get it. The thing with the camels is, you know, they can probably reach eight or nine feet into the air. And it was amazing to watch them go and demolish a hickory wattle tree, or it's what I call a hickory wattle, it's a native wattle that's a bit of a soft wood and it's pretty easy to destroy. And they physically push their face and their head into the thicket of tree material seven or eight feet off the ground. And in a lot of instances, they'd latch onto a branch with their teeth and pull it and break the branch down uh, so that they could get at the green material that they couldn't physically reach. And, and you know, you could see this through the paddock. If you started looking at what the plants were looking like before and after they went in there, you could see that, goodness me, all of a sudden there's a lot of green material getting grazed now that was never, ever getting grazed when the cows were in there. Um, so that, yeah, that would be just one of the indicators. And, you know, obviously if you didn't know whether the plants were going to be poisonous or anything, a dead camel would tell you that that was happening straight away. But they've had the camels there for six months to the best of my knowledge and they're, you know, they're looking pretty good and their feet are pointing in the right direction. Um, they were very clean around the back end. It wasn't as though they'd eaten something that had given them the case of the runs and, you know, as you see a cow or a sheep, it can have a daggy back end because they've eaten something that's not agreeing with them. Mm. And they were just doing a really, really wonderful job. I mean, you know, when, when you were grazing at density, the cows didn't really mind that the camels were in amongst them. And I've heard lots of people say, oh, you know, you can't put cows and camels together. They don't like each other. Well, you know, they believe that that's true. But amazing things happen when you change the grazing to high density and animals have to compete with each other to get a tummy full of feed. All of a sudden, a lot of those niggling little things that used to annoy them have just gone out the window because, heck, I'm hungry and I need to fill my room and mm. let's get on with the job. Ah, oh, that's fascinating. I'm just, I'm absolutely fascinated. I'm just going to close this poll and share it. And um, I, I would agree with the, with the, uh, the uh, what would you say, the social um, status quo here, all of the above are included, I think, is the correct answer for that one. So that was, I thought Judith that was is, an easy one. I'll, I'll, I'll have to take you to task here. Yeah. I'll take you to task here because... If people are aware of managing holistically and they and they use holistic management, I'd agree that all of the above is right. If they're people that aren't aware of what holistic management is, it's pr probably number one. Yeah. Okay. That's true. It doesn't say that in the in the question as well. So that's that's a great great point. So which which of the following are commonly included when people make decisions? Well, if they're not aware of how holistic management works and they've never been aware of, of what managing holistically is about, it's probably number one. Or if it's if you're like me and you're having a bad day, it's probably number one. Uh, but if you're, if you're someone that understands what holistic management is and how it works and how you can use it to your advantage, it's probably all of the above. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's awesome. Um, gee, I haven't checked the chat box. I better check the chat box and see if 
Oh, no, I haven't got any questions yet. So we'll do the next question, which is question seven. During the decision, oh, sorry, defining the decision makers in the whole under management helps you determine what? Um, I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, Jason. Um, I, I sort of fell in love with this little sheet I found, which was, well, I think it determines the whole under the under management. It helps you determine what the whole under management is. It's with your resource base and the money. It's that first step there. I just I was quite attracted to the way it just sort of showed it the holistic context with the little pyramid, and then the decisions, and then to get back in the game. You know, um, you find so many people that are just on their knees saying, you know, they don't want to know what to do, the drought or, or this or that. And I think it gives people such a wonderful tool to go, look, come on, uh, you know, get your gear back in together and, and get yourself uh, under 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 management and, and start working through these really simple processes and it'll get you back back to managing your place, uh, you know, black, back in the red and um, out of the black, sorry, and into, into the black, out of the red and and into, into managing back again. Um, I just think it's such an amazing tool. Are you Judith, can you just scroll back to that question? So, if we're defining the decision makers, defining the decision makers in the whole helps you determine what? Well, it, it helps you determine who the decision makers are and and who is not a decision maker. And it and all and it doesn't say it there on that sheet that Dan's provided, but it also helps you understand who the people with veto power are. Yeah. And you know, we see this a lot in farming situations specifically, but it exists everywhere in the world. But if we're not aware who are the people that have veto power over our decisions, uh, life can get pretty sticky. Well, so also, when we define the decision makers, it's yeah. Yeah, go on. Oh, sorry. It, it was sort of you start doing something, and all of a sudden you realise that hey, you haven't got control of the show. Someone else is is uh, usually making other decisions or causing something to fail. Is isn't that what happens? Yeah. yeah. So we so we need to understand uh, if we've if we've defined the whole under management, and we define who the decision makers are, then we know who's in charge. Then we know who's responsible. Um, then we know who, 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 you know, once we know who are in charge and who are not in charge, then we know who to talk to. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it's a surprise when you realise who might be really in charge, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Like if, uh, if I went to, for argument's sake, if I went to McDonald's, uh, I could complain to the cashier that my chips are cold or I could complain to the manager that my chips are cold. I'm probably going to get a different response from each each person, but I know who's in charge at that place, and it may not be the cashier, but it mm -hmm. definitely is the manager. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, question question eight. What is the purpose of testing decisions and actions with the holistic context in mind? Um, I've actually had. Uh, even before I knew about holistic management, a continuum, and and the only way I could finish my PhD was essentially to, to I had so many things I wanted to do, but you know I decided okay there was a yes no, does this help me get my PhD finished? Yes or no? If it said no, unfortunately that thing had to had to be left to the side because I decided I wasn't going to continue studying my PhD any longer, and that was the only re that was the only way I got to the end of it. So I I think that's the the thing that I that is jumping out at me that I that I would put in my answer is that that it really keeps you on track and there's so many little um, tray calls and shiny things there's so many little things that come along that sort of distract us and we think oh that'd be really cool and you go off chasing those shiny things when really you know you take your your eye off the off the end goal. Um, this is I think say so, uh, from Savory's part of it and I like the little arrow, you know, that the testing questions actually link you back into that holistic goal. Um, that's why I chose it. Did you have anything that you wanted to add with that one there? Uh, look, one thing about that question on slide 27, um, you've, you've, from, a, from a, a circumstance where you're managing land and animals, 
part of the purpose of testing actions and decisions is so that we will be creating the future resource base that we have said we must have. So in my circumstance where we have grazing animals and a piece of land, in the future I want that land to be as healthy as I can make it. I want it to be holding lots of moisture all the time. I want it to be plants at any one period of time. I want my animals to be happy and healthy and I want to have a low cost of production. So what do I have to do today or is the action I'm about to do going to lead me towards that circumstance or away from it? Mm. So, you know, if, 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 I want to, if I want to have a, a local community in the future that's happy and healthy and vibrant, what do I have to do to make sure that's going to be the case? If I want there to be a, a, a well-stocked supermarket in my town in the future, what can I do to make sure that happens? Well, I can shop locally. Mm. Sure, it might cost a little bit more, but if I don't shop there, there's a jolly good chance that, that other people won't shop there and they may go out of business and I may have to travel a long way to do my shopping. It's probably not the case here on the northern Sunshine Coast, but out in your part of the world in, in, in central southwestern Queensland, you know, it gets pretty mundane when you've got to drive 100 kilometres to get a bottle of milk and a loaf of bread. Whereas if the, if the local town was fully functional and everyone shopped there, it would be a different circumstance. So, it's, it, so part of the reason for testing is, a, is, as Brian Marshall likes to say, it's about getting our decisions approximately right instead of dead wrong. Mm, absolutely. You know, I, I was thinking of a good example in the camels because a part of me thought immediately, oh, I wonder what they're going to do with the camels. Are they going to milk them or is there any fibre? But then I thought, no, the camels are actually part of a biologic, you know, there's a specific reason. So I'm assuming that the camels are part of improving the, the diversity of the grazing animals that are on the property. They're probably not going to get into milking them, or are they? Yeah. Don't know. No, look, I don't think their immediate plan is to harvest any part of the of the camel. I, I just adjust to the biological community at the moment. So mm. you could say that those camels are more than earning their keep. Uh, and I've seen photos of other parts of Australia where people have put camels in their cattle and the camels will pull down a branch of a tree and then the cows will come in and eat it because they'd never be able to get access to that plant material before the camel was there. Mm. So it creates this symbiosis and, and look, if they can find a market for camel milk or camel pelts or, or you know, camel rides or something, it would be worth their while exploring that as a business opportunity simply because they've now got a, an expanded resource base than they had a little while ago. Mm, yeah. I'm thinking about the pyramid with the, the base on the bottom of it at the moment, so that's a good, good link back in. Okay. Uh, question nine. This question, Jeffrey and I have thought about a fair bit. We're not sure if we know the answer. We, you have to get into Alan Savory's head a bit, I think. If you understood the need for a desire to manage the Earth's resources holistically 40 years ago, why would it have been difficult, if not impossible? I think it means, why, you know, why would it have been difficult at, you know, that time, as in, in the 1980s or, or yeah. 1970s. Yep. And I think the reason is, or what he, I think what he's getting at is that the that public opinion, I think there's a feeling that public opinion is changing, but he thinks that perhaps back in those 80s there wasn't enough public change in public opinion because that's his sort of, that's where he's going with a lot of his theory now is to work on policy and he says, well, policy is only representing public opinion so you can't change policy if first you don't actually influence the public opinion in some way. Is, is, that, is that the, do you think that's what he's trying to get at? Yeah, Judith, that's, and I've heard Alan talk about this a lot, you know, it's, it's only in the last 20 or 30 years that, that we've been able to communicate with each other relatively simply and easily. I mean, you know, you and I both have people that we know in Africa and in America and we can send them an email and providing they're awake and have their computer on and they choose to respond, we can get an answer back in moments. 30 years ago, it was very difficult to communicate with people and all of a sudden public opinion is changing. People are concerned 
concerned about what's happening to the landscape. You know, you've, you've only got to turn on the TV, and, and Sunday night was a classic example. Uh, this paleo diet, and, and whilst I'm not particularly enamoured with this paleo idea, the fact of the matter is it's come about because people are pretty distressed about the state of human health. So, you know, there's probably going to be a bit more landscape that fails because before more. So, yeah, I, I think Alan's right. It's, it's this policy thing, and, and you know, and we will only change when it's in our best interest to do so, or we're under a great amount of duress. Even though, you know, we can see problems happening, but it's still pretty comfortable, so I don't have to worry about it yet. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, the thing he's alluding to is because it's been so difficult for us to communicate with each other for the last 5,000 years, it wouldn't have mattered when we started saying the world's going to hell in a handbasket, we need to do something about it, until it actually started affecting enough people. Mm -hmm. So so this, sorry, forgive me, I've missed that show on TV. The paleo diet, is that the one where you eat a lot of protein? No, well, sort of. It, 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 it essentially means you eat very next to no dairy, next to no grains, uh, no sugar, uh, no processed foods and no alcohol. So you have a lot of leafy green fresh vegetables of all colours and um, um, naturally raised animal protein. but and um, Pete Evans has championed it here in Australia and it's having a huge effect for a lot of people. Years ago, even though this, this idea has been around for a hell of a long time, it really only seems to be in the last 10 years that all of a sudden people are very, very unhealthy and they're saying, why? Let's do something about it. You know, we knew people were unhealthy back in the 70s uh, and we had the Keep Fit or Life Be In It campaign. We thought it was because people weren't active enough. It's only in the last 20 years that people are saying, hang on, there's something wrong with our food. So mm -hmm. until, you know, until things get really bad and enough people say, hey, we've got to change, wholesale change uh, at a high level will not occur. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's great. Um, I, I know organising events, it's more com becoming more and more common that people ask for uh, a special diet once you, you didn't really worry too much, especially out mm. here, but now a lot of people having uh, irritable bowel or, or things like that and they, they blame the grain and things. So I, I think maybe, uh, well, simple people seem to, a lot of people on gluten-free, I noticed, um, they, they sort of think there's something to do with the grain at the moment. I don't know. <laughs> Great. Um, so this is happens to be the last question. Um, we're doing very good time. Having a look in the chat box, haven't seen any questions chatted yet, so um, I'll ask the last question. Why have integrated multidisciplinary teams not succeeded in solving the resource management um, around the world? Well, I think that it is to do with um, the reductionism process that is part of our science that we divide things into parts and we want to have a really structured solution. And this is actually from Alan Savory's um, course materials where he talks about on this side these are complicated problems but we, you can logically work out how to put someone on the moon, you can write down all the steps or you can write down the steps to build a bridge. But in nature problems or political problems or something to do with the ocean, you can't actually write down anything because they're very complex. There's no logical step-by-step -step process that you could actually do to achieve that. And Savory says that that's just part of human nature, that humans are very good with complicated things like digital watches and phones, but they're not very good with complex things, which are things like the environment. So I, th I think that's what we're what the what we're looking at. That's why science has had some problems with being able to understand problems with the with the environment. Am I am I anywhere close to the to the mark there, Jason? Yeah, Judith, I'd, I'd have to agree with you because you know, as um, and I have to confess, if there's any scientists on the call, I'll apologise up front. I'm not saying it to offend you, but 
a lot of scientists want to know more and more about less and less, and they want to know to the nth degree uh, uh, why something is the way it is. Um, you know, and and the fact of the matter is, if I took a part of my computer out, it would stop working. It it just would stop working. If I came onto your farm and took away half of the animals, or I or I cut off uh, one of the legs of all of your animals. They mightn't necessarily die, but things will keep working to some degree. Hmm. So this, you know, man-made stuff is either black or white, on or off, up or down, in or out. It either works or it doesn't. Nature doesn't work like that, and politics doesn't work like that, as, as Alan's alluded to there. And I'm, 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 I'm pleased to see that he's. I've heard him say that in the past, but I've never really seen it in print. So these things of the natural world or things dealing with, with human society, we can take parts out and it still functions. Mm. So those are what we call complex things, you know, and you go back to the work of Robert Payne that's articulated in the textbook where he, he studied a piece of seashore and he took away a predatory starfish and within a very short period of time, half of the overall population of organisms disappeared. So this is why these things are interrelated, uh, and it's it's very very hard for humans to understand complexity simply because of the way that uh, we've evolved and the way that we've solved problems. And and up until the middle of the 20th century, the Earth was so bountiful that it didn't matter if we if we n used a fresh plastic bag every day. It mm. didn't matter that we used something brand new every day because the world was so bountiful. Well, now we're understanding that the bounty of the world might have a finite limit to it, uh, and we might have to look at reducing, reusing, recycling, and being a lot more clever about the way we use our resources because the natural world is so complex. Who would have thought burning the grasslands of the world could have an effect on the health of the soil or the atmosphere that supports us? We now know that burning the grasslands of the world is a far more dangerous atmospheric pollutant than burning fuel through a motor car. Uh, but for years and years we got along with doing it just fine and no one really cared and things were good and it, obviously it must work. So these complex things are very, very interesting. The complicated things are very, very simple. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, you know, these multidisciplinary teams they can't make things work, and, and into the bargain, they don't have a context uh, about how they want their lives to be, so they're just doing something that, you know, whilst it may be meaningful and it might be interesting, uh, it doesn't necessarily solve a problem. Yeah. I also thought the population, the world's population probably wasn't, of humans, wasn't big enough to make a, a really big difference probably maybe 50 years ago, whereas now a pop our population in Australia is exploding, particularly, you know, if I go to your part of the world, uh, we used to go there as kids um, on holidays yeah. and stay in the same unit in Caloundra and it's unrecognisable to me. Um, I don't hardly remember hardly any of it. Yes, um, it's, it's I think an amazing place now. Yeah, it used to be. It used to be very sort of back. I think it was quite laid back and very friendly. And we used to always stay by the beach. And and now it's all boardwalks and concrete. And oh, it's very different. So that's fantastic, uh, Jason. I liked your answer. I thought um, bringing it back to not just scientists, but also to 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 human the way that human works. And I thought maybe that comes back to you know the left brain, right brain part of us, that, that, that it's something that, you know, it's not our fault, we're just, it's part of human human race, I guess, that, that we have this this um, tendency to go left brain. I notice Alan has been, he might be very right, right brain, but he's been coming back into the middle in trying to um, provide uh, some evidence for, for his... Um, for his ideas and things like that, so he he also probably was at the very uh, right hand side of the right brain continuum, and and people are working with him now, particularly the university groups, to start to bring in some um, structure and 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 things around it. Would you say? Yeah, look, it, it we we have to appreciate that, you know, people say, well, you can dig up a teaspoon of earth out of your garden, and there's probably 
100,000 or a million species of, of animals in there that we've got no idea what they are, what they do, but they're there. This is how complex the natural world is and the fact of the matter is humans have been good enough for a long time to use the natural world to feed and clothe and house themselves. Mm. Um, and because we've got ever more successful at, at exploiting nature, uh, sometimes we think that we've got the upper hand. Well, mm. you know, she'll find a way to bite back hard if she doesn't like what we're doing and we, we see that all over the place, you know, because we've mismanaged the grasslands of the world they're desertifying mm. and that's happening, you know, I, I've only got to drive an hour from where I live over here on the Sunshine Coast and I can find landscapes that are horrendously degraded uh, even, in, even in our environment simply because of the way those people manage those landscapes. Mm. So because it's so complex, we can't have a yes or no, on or off, black or white answer. Yeah. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I added the um, wicked problems in. I, I have met a researcher at University of South Australia who um, was researching wicked problems, which is a little bit, you know, complexity and issue. So there are people in the universities who do understand that. It's, I was just adding that in. Um, yeah. I just put the last couple of slides on because we're just about finished, um, Jason, just to, to get people to think about it's a little bit quirky on the course. So when you go to continue your journey, you click on continue your journey and then it lets you into the next unit, unit two course one. But when you go in, you probably won't see that. You'll just see click here to alert the Savory Institute that you're ready to continue your journey. And this just goes to an email. Um, so you have to click in, when you, it opens up an email thing and it says to the to the administrator or something like that. And you just have to put subject finished unit two, unit one and, and please, you know, please open up unit two. I'm ready to do unit two. So just at this part of it, they obviously haven't got it all um, computer, computer managed at this point. And um, Jeffrey and I were wondering, you know, how does this work? So I just thought if we had problem with it, you probably will have a problem when you get to it as well. So just wanted to let you know that that happens. And this is the map from the online course. I don't know if you've seen this before, Jason. And of course, this is the part that we've just completed in the first sort of, we've done four or five weeks of webinars now. And this is the little part that we've completed. And this is sort of the next unit to go on with. So next week, we'll be going into the ecosystem processes. Um, it's more in depth into the water cycle. And I've got my um, bits and pieces ready to build my efficient rainwater um, demonstrator with the two Coke bottles. So by next week, I will have finished that. And um, thanks very much, Jason, for taking your time out of your very busy day for being here. I really appreciate your expertise and knowledge. And you really add something um, every time you come on. Um, it's just just a, a wealth of knowledge. Obviously, you've been at it for a long time, but also just to um, to check the answers and and to have that insight is is just really valuable. And yeah, we we hope that um, perhaps we can get to some really you know implementation mastery over on the other side of this slide when we start actually looking at um, sites and. Thanks very much for your can-do sites. I hope that, you know, it'd be the hub. The hub would love to have um, people sort of popping up and saying, well, I'd like to have this kind of test or try with this type of site. And one of my dreams is that we might be able to go and have a, um, a view of people's sites. And someone promised me a photo of one of their sites. So I'm hoping that I might get a photo or a few photos to share of, of different people's learning sites and they can come on and have a chat about, uh, you know, what they've actually learned and, and you know, receive the, the same um, kind of insights that you can get from, from these guys um, speaking with, um, you know, the whole community of educators. It's because it's not just you really, Jason, as we've seen. It's a, a whole group in Australia. We really have this um, huge body of knowledge and it's really just about connecting with um, people that just don't know about this yet. So please... Um, Share this if you've if you've enjoyed it and, and and let other people know. I know it's people like to do it in secret, but I think that it's about time that we we started bringing this into the mainstream management because um you know Jason you said about encroaching desert well it's certainly encroaching on us um from from the out southwest of of Queensland and if anyone's had any time to go touring out there you'll know that there is not a blade of grass uh, it is in, it is just absolutely very very scary. 
and um, we have a lot of kangaroos and dingoes and wildlife coming in on us because I think they're just being forced to leave the, the desert. So um, this is, is more than ever is, is, is just absolutely crucial that we get more people um, understanding what this is all about. And I'd, I'd love to have this you know, conversations up and down the street and, you know, instead of people doing it in secret. So, yeah, Jason, do you have any final words or... Look, Judith, thanks, thanks very much for the invitation to participate and I, I hope those other folks that have listened in today have, have got something that they can take home and is going to help them appreciate what they're doing. And uh, as always, it's, it's always a pleasure to be working people that are serious about making some change, whether it's change at a personal level at home or at a community level. Uh, we do have the tools at hand now that we can arrest a failing environment. And the, the beautiful thing is it's not hard and we can make money from it at the same time. Um, and this will work practically in any environment on the face of the earth, whether it's Mitchell, whether it's southeast Queensland, whether it's North America or whether it's Europe. We can make this happen. And that one of those very early slides you had today talking about Rat, uh, Dr. Rattan Lull, uh, you know, we don't have to take much carbon out of the atmosphere to reset the environment, to reset the atmosphere to a climate that's going to work for us. The thing we've got to ask is how many people are serious about it. And um, uh, yeah, as always, it's just great fun to, to be involved with something uh, like this teleseries. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jason. We'll leave it there and um, let you go on with your day. But thanks very much. I've really enjoyed the day with you. Cheers now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.